existence precedes essence. If we had to encapsulate Sartre's philosophy in a sort of in, 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 a, in a string of words, it would be that existence precedes essence. It means that first we exist and then we find who we are. But what does that mean? We will use this lecture to explore this notion of existence preceding essence. We will look at Jean-Paul Sartre's ideas about radical freedom, um, his thoughts about anguish and good faith as well as bad faith. Then we will look at what it means to act in good faith. And finally, we will look at how we can create value. Jean-Paul Sartre was a French philosopher who lived in the 20th century. And he was a Parisian. He was born in 1905 in Paris, France. And for some background, he lost his father at a young age and then he was raised by his mom and his maternal grandmother. He studied at the Ecole Normale Supérieure in Paris and then he showed innate skills in philosophy. He excelled in it and he was influenced by a number of figures that would sort of prefigure his thoughts he would be especially influenced by Heidegger, by Martin Heidegger, who in turn would be influenced by Nietzsche as well as by Edmund Husserl. Um, he became a significant figure in the philosophy of what we call existentialism as well as phenomenology. And his major work, Being a Nothingness, which is from 1943, would explore existentialist concepts. He was a lifelong activist and advocate for human rights and he claimed individual responsibility. He wasn't just a philosopher, he was also a, an author and amongst his literary contributions there are several novels, several plays and essays and his notable works would include Nausea, for example, No Exit, as well as the Roads to Freedom uh, series. He often explored, like I said, existentialist themes and the human condition. When it came to political involvement, Sartre was particularly active in political causes, especially during and after the Second World War. He was a vocal critic of French colonialism, France, in the 40s had several, col um, several colonies as well as he was critical of what was then American foreign policy. He supported Marxist principles and he was also affiliated with the French Communist Party, um, although he never really joined them formally. When it came to his personal life, he was very close. He had a lifelong partnership with a fellow philosopher and uh, writer, the French philosopher Simone de Beauvoir. De Beauvoir would be um, one of the key figures in the second wave of feminism in the 19, up, up to the 1960s and their relationship was both intellectually fruitful they were they both excelled at what they did they traded philosophies so to speak between them but it was also non-traditional in the sense that it was marked by an open relationship they were free to pursue other people whilst they were together, but at the same time, um, of course this is non-conventional even today, let alone 60 years ago, but it also was founded on what one assumes was a profound mutual respect for each other. In 1964, he was awarded the Nobel Prize in Literature, but he turned it down, he declined it. 
and his refusal was based on his beliefs that writers should not align themselves with institutions they should keep out of institutions he criticized institutions therefore why should he align himself with one such institution Later on in his life, in his later years, he continued to write. He stayed active in political and social issues until his death. And then he passed away on, um, on April the 15th, 1980. He died in Paris. His contributions to philosophy, to literature, to political thought have had quite a lasting influence they have had a lasting impact on a number of fields and this makes him one of those major key figures of 20th century not just philosophy but of the 20th century as a whole like i've said in the beginning his main thought can be symbolized in the expression existence precedes essence existence comes before essence like nietzsche sartre rejects the existence of god he denies this existence to such a big deity and his views then his philosophy is a comes part and parcel with this thought, with this rejection. Um, as did Nietzsche, Sartre sees the existence of God as implying certain limitations on human nature and human choice and human activity, as well as human responsibility. I've mentioned one of, one of his influences, Martin Heidegger, Heidegger was a German philosopher who in the 30s published this book called Being and Time and Being and Time would be highly influential on the development of existentialism, philo existentialist philosophy like Sartre's. In Being and Time, as well in other places, Heidegger explains that we are he describes our type of existence as being in the world being dash in dash the dash world we are being in the world we are thrown in the world with dashes in between the words we are thrown in the world we have a certain thrownness about us what does this mean we have no choice whether to exist or not. We are made to exist. We're not consulted, definitely. But we somehow find ourselves suddenly existing. And as we grow up, we realize that we exist, of course. But we're thrown in the world. And this is what we call part of facticity. I'll get into further details as we progress with the lecture about facticity. But it's one of those facts in a quick nutshell. Facticity, as in our thrownness in the world, is one of those facts uh, we, we can't really change, right? We, we, we've been made to exist. We can choose to cut it short if need be, but the fact that we've come into existence can't be changed. And uh, it's the background the fact that we exist is the background against which all human freedoms then are allowed to be are allowed to take hold to exist um, the fact that we've come into existence this is one of those facticities for sartre we are made to exist and then as we proceed with our existence as we exist we form our essence existence comes before essence 
existence precedes essence. First we exist and then we form ourselves. So this existence that we have, the existence of us, is prior to our essence. In other words, it's up to us then to decide what sort of person we are going to be. Um, life would be intrinsically meaningless in a sense and we must work on bringing meaning or purpose to our lives. So first we exist, then we find our essence and in along these lines therefore existentialism is the opposite of essentialism. Essentialism being about essence. Essentialism would claim that life has an intrinsic meaning, an intrinsic purpose, an intrinsic essence. What makes life life, what makes us us, perhaps in some cases comes before we actually exist. And for some, for, for some background, we can easily think of traditional society. Traditionally, society was one that was built around you having certain traits, you being you, before you actually exist. So let's take, um, uh, let's take an example. So we have this inherent identity, we can say, we have this inherent value, traditionally. Sartre denies that. Sartre tells us that it's through our consciousness that we can create our own value. We can give meaning or essence to our existence through our choices. Therefore, our essence is something that we, as individual human beings, create for ourselves. Imagine a paper knife, and this is actually an example Sartre gives. Imagine you have a paper knife, it's made by someone, right? It's made by an artisan. And this artisan has a conception of the paper knife. Before he starts working on it, he already knows what he wants to make out of the raw materials that he owns. So he, the, 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 the artisan has a formula in his mind to which he then adheres in order to create a paper knife. The paper knife has a certain task to fulfill. There's a definitive pur purpose that it should follow. Therefore, its essence, its existence follows its essence. Conceivably, you can't produce a paper knife without knowing what it is for. You can find some object lying about and think, ah, I'll use, a, I'll use a ruler today instead of a paper knife. But if you want a paper knife, you will need to know that you want to create a paper knife if you want to make one. Right? So the essence of the paper knife, that is the sum of the qualities of the paper knife that make this object a paper knife, come before the existence of the individual paper knives then. So the essence comes before existence. This is essentialism. This is what essentialism is about. And from a religious point of view, when God made man, when God made human beings, he knew precisely what he was creating, what he was making. The idea of man with a capital M, with a capital M, of humanity, the idea of humanity in the mind of God would be akin to that of a paper knife in the mind of the artisan. So you start with the concept, so to speak. You start with the essence. And then it follows a definition and a formula. How do we make it? We make, it, we make this object, be it human being or be it a paper knife, in the image of this concept that 
exists in the creator's mind, the maker's mind. Each individual human being is therefore the realization, it's the making actual, making real creation of a certain idea that exists in the mind of God. So in this sense, in a universe in which God is the creator of everything, including human beings, the essence comes before the existence of human, be of, of human beings. But God is dead, told us Nietzsche. Sartre follows those footsteps. In an atheistic universe, one in which God does not exist, there is at least one being which exists before it can be defined by any concept. That being is the human being. So human beings, first of all, come into being, and then through having this freedom, this autonomy to define ourselves, we actually then form our own essence. We define ourselves after we are brought into existence. There is therefore no such thing as human nature. Because human nature seems to imply that there are traits that happen regardless of perhaps our choices, etc. Human nature seems to imply natural law and natural law seems to imply a, a, a maker of those laws. Someone who comes with the ideas of those laws. Natural law in terms of, hu of human conduct, right? And um, But since there is no God to have a, con a, con a conception of human nature, therefore there is no such thing as human nature. The conclusion would be, therefore, the first principle of existentialism would be that we have no fixed human nature. We have no fixed morality to determine human action. Unlike a stone, unlike a table, unlike a paper knife, after we come into existence, through our individual will, we are then free to conceive and make ourselves create our essence. Before all else, human beings proper, human beings project themselves towards the future and they're aware of doing so. We are aware of our future. We can think of tomorrow and we move ourselves towards this tomorrow. Now let's talk a bit about radical freedom and the creation of value. So, based on what we've discussed so far, based on this argument, Sartre believes that our freedom is radical. It is absolute. We have absolute freedom. The first effect of existentialism is that each person possesses him or herself. We own ourselves. We have, therefore, absolute power to choose how to act in any circumstance we find ourselves in. This places the entire responsibility of our existence squarely upon our shoulders. We each have a choice, and every act that we choose is freely chosen, we're free 
to choose how to act. We would be lying to ourselves if we were to say that we have no choice but to do something. We always have a choice. When we choose not to act, we are still choosing. Therefore, the act of not choosing is still an act of choosing. And with that comes the responsibility of not having chosen. If we choose to abdicate that choice, that is still a choice. It's a choice to not choose, but we still made a choice. And with that choice comes responsibility. So, Sartre, you, 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 we're never really let off by Sartre. We're always, um, uh, we're always forced to face our choices. We're always made to confront our actions. Even when we think we're not acting, we're still acting. We're, why? Because we're still choosing. The choice is an act in itself. Choosing not to choose is still a choice. Therefore, it's still an act. Therefore, we're still responsible for that. Moreover, when we say that the human being is responsible for, for, for himself or for, him, for herself, we don't only mean that we are responsible for our own individuality, for us individually, but we're also made responsible for everyone else. This is Sartre's view. When the existentialist says that the human being chooses himself, he also means that he chooses for all human beings. Through this choice, through such a choice, through moral choices, by affirming the value of that which is chosen, we are also creating an image of what we think is the ideal human being. Let me break this down. Essentially, when we choose, we're making a statement, particular moral choices, right? Um, not so much about choosing between white chocolate and dark chocolate. This is more about moral choices, those choices that matter, so to speak, that confirm our moral agency. But when we choose, we're making a statement. We're making a statement about what we think is the right choice. So in a sense, we're flagging to everyone, we're showing to everyone what should what the better option is or what the choice should be like. So in this sense, we are choosing for everyone to see. For, for every, we're setting a standard. We're setting a precedent. And we can't really escape this because we are unable ever to not choose. What we choose is also is always the what we think is the better choice, right? When we choose, we are creating value. With this argument, Sartre manages to save the concept of value. So even though nothing has intrinsic value, but through our choices, we are creating value. We're injecting value into things. So actions may not be intrinsically valuable but through our choices we are creating value therefore value therefore for sartre value still is a valid thing to 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 measure to judge actions with the exception that now we are the creators of value it's not something we've been handed down but it's something that we create we create value and we create value through our choices if i had to choose between action a and action b intrinsically 
both actions do not have value. But through my choice, I'm imbuing one of those options with value. Therefore, this means that our responsibility is much greater than we had originally supposed. For it doesn't just concern one person, it doesn't just concern me personally, but it concerns mankind as a whole. Our actions would be a commitment on behalf of all mankind. So, in shaping ourselves and fashioning ourselves, we're also fashioning mankind. Let's move on and look at the concept of anguish. Now, this radical freedom that Sartre mentions, as well as radical responsibility that comes with it, means that we are in a state of what existentialists call anguish. So what do we, what do we mean by this? When someone commits themselves to anything, they are deciding not only for themselves, but for all mankind, as we've seen. But they also can't escape from the sense of complete and profound responsibility. Remember, through choosing, we are creating value. Through creating value, we're also creating value not just for us personally, but as a value for all human beings. Now, with that, we can't escape the sense of complete and profound responsibility. There's this awareness that dawns on us, this realization that comes that we are ultimately responsible for our actions and that these actions are examples to everyone else. We're setting an example to everyone else. This is how I've chosen to act and this is what I think, this is how I think others should act as well. We are to ask ourselves, therefore, what would happen if everyone did so? This is a bit, it seems to hearken a bit back to um, Kantian universalization. The universalizability test tests the um, uh, tests choices, it tests actions by imagining what would happen if this were to be made a universal action, therefore if everyone had to follow it. Um, so when we do this in Sartrean terms, it reminds us of Kant, okay, but Sartre seems to be echoing that Kantian approach to morality, that Kantian approach to universalizability. So we're ask, we are to ask ourselves what would happen if everyone did so. And this sort of brings to the fore that there's a universal value to our choices and to our actions. This brings anguish. This brings that feeling, that awareness, that heaviness that comes with our choices, with our facing moral dilemmas, moral choice. Um, it, it, it comes with an awareness that we have a pure and simple form of anguish. It's a heavy thing to carry that awareness of our freedom, but also that responsibility of our freedom. Sartre gives us an example of this by using a military leader as an example. So when you have a military leader who takes the responsibility for an attack and sends a number of men to their death, keep in mind that Sartre lived through the Second World War. Um, uh, examples related to war and to armies etc were quite 
um, were, were quite well placed given the context of Sartre's life, especially his, his era, by the time of his earlier writing. So when you have a military leader and that leader takes the responsibility for an attack, he sends a number of soldiers, but those soldiers end up dead. The way we have to see, the way we have to view such a choice by the military leader is that it was his choice or her choice. And at the very bottom of it, that leader chooses alone. It's no one else's choice. It is that leader's choice. In making the decision, one can't feel but a certain anguish. We can't help but feel the anguish of burden or the burden of moral choice, especially when it's difficult choices that we have to make. Deciding to send over the edge 3,000 men in the First World War, you know, out of the trench onto the oncoming army. There was an anguish to that. Most captains, commanders on site, etc., knew that this was it. You're pushing, you're giving the push, but that push means that these men that you have under your care are essentially condemned to death. And uh, that anguish, however, does not prevent the, does not prevent us from acting, from making a choice. Even if you choose not to choose, you're still choosing, Sartre tells us. On the contrary, um, the action presupposes that there is a plurality of possibilities, right? What does this mean? It means that when we choose to act, there has to be a choice. Choice means having more than one option, a plurality of possibilities. So there's more than one possibility I can take. If it was just one, I can't be held responsible because I didn't choose as such. See? But having a choice means you have more than one option. You have more than one possibility of choosing. And when we choose one of those possibilities, or when the leader, this military leader, chooses one of those possibilities, then he realizes that that choice has value only because it was chosen. So through the act of choosing, that military leader has given value to that choice. Anguish, this feeling of anguish, therefore, rather than screening us from action, rather than shielding us from action, is a condition of action itself. And this leads to another point that is a result of God's death, and that is abandonment. With God's non-existence, there are consequences that come. And we need to understand those consequences. With the death of God, there had been attempts to suppress God. And one of the things we tried to do was to... Okay, so we have the theory of evolution by Darwin. And somehow we don't really need to say that God doesn't exist. There's still space for God. Or we've shifted the model of the universe, the model of the cosmos, from a geocentric model to something else, a heliocentric model. So the Earth got shifted sideways. Ah, but that's okay, because there's still space for God. God has other gaps to fill, so to speak. So there has been an attempt when it came to 
God's denial, where we still claimed that we tried to suppress God at the least possible expense. We tried to make God's disappearance as inconspicuous as possible, right? We tried to pay the least amount of payment to make God disappear. So in, in a sense, it's like we never quite denied God is there. We've just changed bits of the narrative, but God was still there. Why? Because we previous attempts to suppress God were at the least possible expense. And uh, Sartre explains how previous formulations of secular, of secular morality, while denying God's existence, still claimed that it is essential that certain values, um, for instance, to be honest, not to lie, not to beat one's wife, um, the responsibility to bring up children, etc., should be considered to exist a priori all the same. In fact, we've replaced God with something else, but all of God's rules were still there. And this meant that those rules came a priori, they came before our existence. Those values came before our existence. So in other words, what Sartre is telling us is that previous attempts um, thought that nothing will be changed if God does not exist. God will still somehow, sorry, God, God is not there, but his presence is. God is not there, but his rules are still there. God is not there, but morality is still the same, more or less, minus the go to church on Sundays or go to the synagogue on Saturdays or go to Mecca once in your lifetime. But OK, so that disappears. But all the other rules, the rules of conduct, how should we conduct ourselves? How should we conduct ourselves vis-a-vis -vis other persons, other people, our society? That is still very much there, right? And that comes before, it comes a priori, our existence. On the contrary, to his horror, the existentialist realizes that with the disappearance of God, there also disappears all possibility of finding universal a priori values. God is gone. With God disappears our possibility of finding values that exist a priori from before. There can therefore no longer be any universal unchanging moral laws that exist independently of us. Since there's no infinite and perfect consciousness that is God to think them, we needed a God, we needed this infinite and perfect consciousness to come up with infinite and perfect moral laws, unchanging moral laws. That source has gone. That source that thinks up these, these laws, these unchanging moral laws, has gone. And with God's death, there is now nowhere written that the good exists, for example. The good as a, the idea of good. The real good, good with a capital G. The form of the good that exists on a different plane of existence. It exists somewhere transcendental that is not subject to change. So it exists in eternity. That has gone now. Um, the idea that we must be honest, for instance, or that we must not lie, since there now only exist human beings. That's the only thing that exists. And those human beings have absolute moral freedom. That absolute moral freedom is what we use to make our own laws, to create moral value. 
quoting Dostoevsky, Sartre tells us that if God does not exist, then everything would be permitted. So, if God doesn't exist, then we're free to do whatever we want. Dostoevsky tells us. The result of this is that we are forlorn. We're forlorn. So, we killed God. God is dead and we killed him, Nietzsche. We killed God and ended up abandoned. We discover that we are without excuse. We have no one else to blame. When things go wrong and the, and they go wrong because of our choices, because of our choices, we can't say, "Ah, it's not my fault. I was made to do it. I had no choice. I had to do this." Right? Well, you did have a choice to choose, even if you choose to obey, if you choose to do what other people tell you to do, or choose not to do, whatever, you still are responsible for that choice, for those choices. We've covered determinism in a different lecture, and we've mentioned that determinism claims, determinism is a point of view, it's a view of the universe that claims that when it comes to freedom, especially hard determinism, claims that we're not free, really free, we don't have a choice. We do things because of causes that lie outside of us. We are made to do things, therefore we can't be held responsible for what we do. That is what determinism does. But with Sartre giving us absolute freedom, we end up in a place where we have no determinism to blame. And we have no justification. We have no excuse for our choices. We are left alone. We're condemned to be free. We're condemned to be free. We're condemned because we do not choose to exist. And yet, despite not having this choice, from the moment we start to exist, we are responsible for everything that we do. This is why we call Sartre's brand of freedom radical freedom. It really is a heavy freedom. It's a freedom that fills us with responsibility. Linked to this, there is also the concept of despair, there's the idea of despair. Whenever we will anything, whenever we drive ourselves towards a choice, whenever we will anything, there's always an element of probability. Let's say we're counting on a friend to come and visit us and this friend will be arriving by bus and we presuppose that the bus will arrive on time. We remain in the realm of possibilities. However, we rely on possibilities that are strictly concerned in our actions. We should not be bothered by possibilities which do not affect um, our action and, like, and vice versa. So, when we count on a visit from a friend, say, we presuppose that this bus will arrive on time. Do I have control over it? No. But we assume that things will play the way they do. Sometimes if someone is late, we have a date, we have an appointment, we have a meeting with a friend, and they're late. Nowadays, of course, we have mobile phones, but let's just imagine for a minute, we didn't have phones, we didn't have WhatsApp and and texts and, and, and nothing of this sort, like it was in Sartre's time, right? If you're waiting for someone to turn up and they never turn up and you're waiting and it's at 10 minutes, you know, 15 minutes, you start to feel this despair. Um, um, you start to feel this anxiety building up and it turns into desperation. Um, Sartre, however, tells us that we should, however, we completely con be completely concerned with 
our action, for we are our actions. We're nothing else but the sum of our actions. We're not born cowards, we're not born heroes. We are defined as cowards and heroes through the deeds that we do. The choices that we have define us. How we choose to act defines us. Any despair, any anguish that we feel is bound. If it's real anguish, if it's real despair, that is real despair. That is real anguish when it's about our choices. Things we have no control over, it's a bit stoic in the sense. Things we have no control over, then there's no place for desperation there. What we have this, what we should have despair, what we should be concerned with is our action. I've mentioned that Sartre was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1964. He chose, he chose to turn it down. And he said that he didn't want to be part of the institution. For many years, for decades, he had consistently rejecting prizes. He, at some point, he was awarded the Legion d'Honneur, which would be sort of like like an MBE in, in, in France. Um, uh, it's a bit like being made a member of the of, of the of the of the order of the state, right? And the Legion d'Honneur was the highest honor bestowed by France on its citizens. Sartre turned this down. Sartre rejected this because he didn't want to be counted as part of the institutions. From what we've covered so far about, about Sartre, we can see that he was so vociferous on individuality. This whole philosophy of us being free to choose and, and, and that choice being personal, being individual, that is empowering to the individual. It allows us to form our own essence. And the Nobel Prize, when it was, when he was nominated for it, when he was awarded, actually, the Nobel Prize in 1964, it was based for, for his work, which, quote-unquote, is rich in details and filled with the spirit of freedom and the quest for truth. The prize continues that Sartre's work has exerted a far-reaching influence on our age. So the Nobel Committee recognized Sartre's contribution to the, the, to the age in which he was writing. So his theory that existence precedes essence, right? He formulated that first in 1945, in what is called Existentialism as a Humanism. It was a lecture he delivered and then it was subsequently published uh, a year later. Let's go a bit into more detail about the background to existence precedes essence. So we're thrown in the world, as Heidegger would say, and then through our exercising this, this freedom that we have, we find and we define who we are. So first we come into existence and then we have to shape ourselves through our free choices. And it's a lifelong process. It's not something we do once. This is something we are constantly working on. This exercise to define ourselves. This was an idea that goes diametrically opposite to what had been going on for centuries. For instance, in India, for example, in India, you had the ancient caste system 
we, the a caste society c a s t e a caste society decides what you are based depending on uh, the, the decides what you are based on what your ancestors were and you have new generations coming up generation after generation after generation and new generations are stuck in this level in their parents and grandparents and then great grandparents straight home until the day that they die so if you're born the child of a servant you will be a servant if in a century and a half your children will have children of their own and then they have children of their own and have children of their own they will also be servants like you and all your ancestors and for centuries society in the west functioned in a very similar manner in a very similar way if you are born a peasant you will die a peasant essentially your chances of becoming a king were more or less nil kings were and still are made out of an intensely restricted group of people therefore essence came before existence prince william the heir to the throne in the uk his essence has been written before he was even conceived why because there was a monarch there was elizabeth back then and elizabeth's firstborn male heir back then automatically would have also led if he had offspring of his own to the firstborn male heir to be in the line of succession of direct su succession therefore of course eventually charles was born and then charles had william um actually yes exactly charles was born and then william was born but william's essence had been decided at least since when elizabeth's dad was made king king george the sixth if i'm not mistaken right after the abdication of his brother but as soon as as george the sixth albert became monarch then the whole genealogy changed of who should succeed whom and the essence of those generations to come had been written a priori now of course one could argue that ah but they could abdicate fair enough yes but on but but, but the rules are are those right that your essence who you are that william's um, eldest child eldest son it will also become king eventually if the monarchy lasts that comes before him even existing it's part of the rules so essence in this sense precedes existence essence comes before existence even before you are born in a system like this you already have your social place written in stone in a sense that place was part of the divine order of things and um, the divine order of things describes society as having a hierarchy of sorts and uh, it's handed down by god himself it's given by god himself therefore it's, it's unquestionable you wouldn't question god therefore you wouldn't question the divine order of things sartre was french barely 130 years 40 years 30 years before sartre's birth there was a massive upheaval of French society. The French Revolution, with the social turmoil that followed, started to turn things over their head. And you have this massive shift, this massive 
break in how society is structured, you know, before you had the king on top, and then, you know, but with the first revolution, and then with the second French revolution, you have a succession of French republics always trying to fix something perceived broken with the previous one, right? But this was a march leading to a substantial revision of how societies should be structured. It was a march towards increased secularization, for instance. And finally, after more than a century of this upheaval of these upheavals in French society, Sartre's existentialism gives the new philosophy a concrete voice. First you're born, you come into existence. Then, through your choices, through exercising your free will, you build who you are, you shape yourself. So, one of the things that results from such an approach is that we are condemned to be free. We can't help but being free. And to see this in context, we must keep in mind that for centuries, our essence, what makes us us, was something determined by society. So if you're born of servants, you remain a servant. Uh, you, you, will, you will grow up to be a servant. Um, you had a world that revolved around notions of class and state and both of which were considered as constituting the essence of what we are. So the essence of a chair would be that we can sit on it. That of a pen, that we can write with it. That of a, um, a pen knife is that it, uh, of, a, of a paper knife is that it can cut, it can slice through envelopes, say. But for Sartre, our essence is not something we are born with. For Sartre, our essence is something that we grow and develop ourselves. So we're born in this world free to make ourselves, and the implication is that our choices fall squarely on our shoulders then. And this is a substantial responsibility. It's not, it's not something weak. It's not something small. It's equally empowering and intimidating with great power comes great responsibility says spider-man but likewise actually spider-man's uncle but likewise with great freedom comes great responsibility we are in a sense therefore condemned to be free because we can't unburden ourselves of this great responsibility I've mentioned determinism in the, the, uh, 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 some moments ago. If we do something without having a choice, then we're forced to, to do it. The burden of the act would not be on us. However, if we do something out of free will, because we will it, then the responsibility of that act is ours to carry. So, while freedom sets us free it also forces us to shoulder the weight of our decisions of whether it's in our decisions or in decisions we're still responsible for both like nietzsche i've said i've, I've, I've as i've mentioned already like nietzsche sartre rejects god Existentialism would have a long history, going back with Nietzsche and even before we have Kierkegaard and other figures who sort of prefigure existentialism. Interestingly, Kierkegaard was not an atheist, but he was very much a believer. But you have several figures of um, who, who are considered to be proto-existentialist, um, Dostoevsky amongst others, and the Russian writer, um, uh, but it would sort of find its feet in the first half of the 20th century between Germany and France 
and Nietzsche would play a major role in this influence. Sartre, being an atheist, perhaps the most famous atheist of the 20th century, um, would pour over Nietzsche's works. He would spend long, long hours studying Nietzsche, reading Nietzsche, trying to interpret Nietzsche, trying to understand Nietzsche. His subsequent works would be influenced by this death of God. Um, you have this divine set of commandments that for centuries had been telling us what we should do, what we shouldn't do, right? Do not kill, do not steal, go to church, etc. But these have now lost their divinity. But even so, there's a sense of good and bad that has not disappeared with them. So God is absent, like we said, but the structures he built are still there. So it's like an empty throne, but the throne, as, as in no one is sitting in the throne, but the throne is still there. They're still there, they've lost their divinity, fair enough. The divine has left the room, but they're still there. Um, but even so, a sense of good and bad has not disappeared along with the absence of the of divinity. Somehow we feel we need some sort of knowledge to perhaps be better people, to be able to make the right choices. God's absence, the scientific revolution, an increasingly naturalistic view of the world, the political turmoil that had been running in Europe, um, leading to the displacement of the old guard, the old societal systems. Then you had the brutality of the First World War, and then you have the brutality of the Second World War. You have the senseless killing of millions upon millions of people. Existentialism would sort of be the culmination of these, of these happenings. God's death, his disappearance, takes with it traditional morality, and um, you know the idea of heaven, etc. They don't make sense anymore. Um, in the absence of heaven and hell, what do we do? How do we live? What does living the good life mean? What should I choose? Based on what? They're not ideas new to Sartre. Sartre doesn't come up with these questions. He doesn't even come up with a secular form of morality. You had people like Kant who would say that morality is not something that should be handed down by religion. His categorical imperatives, Kant's categorical imperatives, in fact, they're universal rules that apply to everyone, everywhere, always. They are moral absolutes that can be understood by everyone. Why are they absolutes? What makes them so absolute, so universal? Why can wh wh why do we place such high value to universalization when it comes to Kant? Because they are rules, they are laws, they are imperatives that we can arrive at through the exercise of reason. Reason being this abstract, pure activity that we do that does not depend on what mood we're in. It doesn't depend on the weather or whether we've slept well enough, right? So the use of reason being such a clean way of arriving at truths is described as the right method and tool to follow that will allow us to understand something that has absolute value. If we want to learn absolute values, we should do what 
the discipline of that we should follow the um the methods of the discipline of absolute values we should be mathematical maths has this thing maths is abstract it's conceptual it doesn't depend on what mood you're in two and two will, al will always make up four regardless of whether you like coffee or tea one and one will always add up to two the value of pi even though it's more or less indeterminate in its completeness but it's always the same you know, nothing will change the fact that you have a certain ratio between the diameter and the circumference that is more or less slightly more than three times so that is maths for you it's rational it's clean it's pure it never changes its truths are universal therefore if we want to arrive at truths including moral truths that are as certain as maths we need to use the same technique we need to use the same tools we need to be rational that is how kant tried to construct morality a secular morality the use of reason is that right method that tool that allows us to understand something that has absolute value now sartre on top of all this introduces um introduces the absolute freedom that we have how do we find meaning in this freedom heidegger presented the idea of us being thrown in the world we've mentioned this and now we're going further on this as it were we we, we get hurled in the world and then we sort of make ourselves we shape ourselves our thrownness according to heidegger is part of our facticity what is facticity facticity are the facticity is made up of those things that we cannot change things on which we have no influence and they are immutable they don't change it's the facts surrounding our birth it's the it's the society we are a part of it's the fact that we are mortal it's the fact that we die on this background of facticity it's a human condition essentially it's on this background of facticity we can then decide who we want to be so there are things we can't change but then there are things we can change existence is one of those things we cannot change the fact that we have been made to exist we like i've said we can choose to cut short that existence but still existence per se our existence is not something we had or have a say over the fact we have suddenly become to existence this 13 billion year old universe you know we happen to occupy one tiny little slice of time incredibly finite amount of time out of this infinity of time right that is what we have we can't change that um so in a sense since facticity since existence is facticity we can say that facticity precedes essence there are facts we have no control over but then there is that space in which we can transcend we can rise above we can go beyond those facts that we can't change about us in a post god life devoid of intrinsic meaning devoid of purpose it is up to us then to transcend to go beyond and become the person we would like to become um so while espousing a highly individual individualistic philosophy sartre also committed towards a socialist philosophy and this is tied to finding meaning in freedom because for sartre 
for society, for members of society, but, but for society at large as well, for society to be truly free, he believed, those members of society, the, the, the members of society, right? The, the society's members need to live within a class late, uh, a classless, uh, stateless political environment. If you want freedom to be the case in society, then you can't have distinction of class. You can't have states. Statehood, classhood, these are things that affect our freedoms negatively. They curtail our freedom. If you want to be truly free, we have to get rid of these things. Institutions symbolize thou, those, um, those limits that we have, those constraints the classes etc so accepting the Nobel Prize for Sartre meant that he would be associating himself with a particular social class in this case it would have been the social class of Nobel laureates right but it would have been a self-defeating prospect for someone intent on showing us that we are all fundamentally free that we need to be truly free. That is why Sartre turns down the Nobel Prize as well as a number of other acknowledgements that he got. Now, let me finally mention a bit, mention something about authenticity and bad faith. Now, Let's start with an example Sartre gives us. Sartre, in the sense, he gives the example of a grocer. And, he's, and, and, and in a sense, we see that there's still some lingering ideas of what people should be, right? But imagine a grocer who dreams um, of being something other than a grocer. Sartre claims that these dreams would be offensive to the buyer because when someone goes to the grocer and the grocer is dreaming on this about that, right? He's not being wholly a grocer. He's being something else as well. And society demands that a grocer limits himself to his function as a grocer. Keep in mind this was written in the 1940s. Nowadays we've... And Sartre has left his mark, as well as de Beauvoir, who claims that even women have a choice whether to become women or not. Right? Being a woman is, um, is, is something of a process, it's not something you're born. Along with these two figures, we have a number of other figures who, well, in the past 50, 60, 70 years, have further developed such existentialist ideas. Sartre continues that there are indeed many precautions to imprison a man in what he is, as if we lived in fear that he might break away and escape his condition. Essentially, when a grocer, Sartre is telling us, when a grocer starts to dream, we as society find that offensive because we fear that he might escape his condition we're happy accepting someone being who this someone is supposed to be but we can't really deal very well with those with that someone having the freedom to break free of that mold and this is a bit of statement which is situated in time. Perhaps in Sartre's time, perhaps in the 40s, this was the case. Nowadays it's harder to claim that Sartre was right um, across the board. Of course, there would be cases when people are not happy with other people changing direction in life 
but more or less today we accept that people change, people have different uh, different wishes. Sometimes people do a job that they're not they don't really like, but then they make up for it with a hobby. Um, in Sartre's time, and according to Sartre's explanation, this is not something that really happened. We tend to box people in, and we'd like them to stay in their box. We label things. You are the grocer. You're the grocer. Please don't play the car mechanic with me if you're the grocer. You can't be. Please don't be the artist if I'm treating you as a grocer. Stay a grocer, right? This is what society. This is what Sartre saw. But then the, fundam the fundamental claim of existentialism is that we're always free to choose, no matter the situation. And this very freedom is something we cannot escape, to the point that we're condemned to be free, like we said. So there may be facticity that imposes limits on us. We cannot be forced to follow some course over another. Fair enough, there's facticity. But there is still space. That space is the transcendent space. That's where we're free to act. Um, now, what happens is that sometimes we give in to pressure. We give in to external social pressure. Our choices are then made in bad faith. Um, or as Sartre puts it in French, mauvaise foi. So what we do is we give up our innate freedom. When we give up our innate freedom, when we deny ourselves that freedom that we have, we live inauthentically. We are deceiving ourselves. If we want to be ourselves, to exercise that freedom, we have then to face authenticity. We can become authentic. Living inauthentically is not a good thing. Living authentically is a good thing. That's what we should strive for. We can only strive for authenticity once we accept that we have absolute freedom once we accept that our choices inform us once we accept that yes there is existence but that existence comes before essence because essence is what we can create we can make ourselves um sartre left a mark like i've mentioned already the beauvoir he, uh, she explored the implications of Sartre's exist existentialism, especially for women, what it meant for women, and she wrote The Second Sex, which formed a philosophical framework that would be used to fight against the oppression of women, for instance. Um, um, he was a prominent voice of the French resistance during World War II, then eventually subsequentialist, um, sub subsequent philosophers would have a range of reactions to the works of Sartre. You have Foucault, who would be heavily Michel Foucault, and he died in 19, shortly after Sartre. He died of AIDS. He was a French philosopher. Um, but anyways, Foucault, who would be not a contemporary of Sartre, but he would be younger than Sartre. He would be very heavily influenced by Sartre and his ideas about freedom and authenticity and the construction of identity. His ideas about the role of power and knowledge in shaping the self. These would can be seen as an extension and a development of Sartre's ideas about bad faith, mauvais foi, and self-deception. You have figures, you have other figures like Jacques Derrida, Derrida who died in 2004, so quite contemporary we can say, who would argue that Sartre's emphasis on conscious choices and personal responsibility oversimplified 
the complex and nuanced ways in which individuals are shaped by structures such as language and power. Um, that brings our lecture to a close. Next time we will have a lecture, we will delve into applied philosophy. We'll be covering um, uh, two types, two, two, two wide brackets. We'll be covering privacy and cyberspace. We'll be covering what morality can teach us, how, um, what these figures we've covered can teach us in terms of today's technological society. And then we, when we've closed that bracket, we move on onto life and death issues. So we look at the bookends of life, right? The beginning of life with things such as assisted reproductive technology, ART, um, in vitro, fertilization, cloning, etc. And then after that lecture, we have another lecture that deals with end of life um, issues, which includes physician assisted suicide and euthanasia. That's all for today. Um, um, that's it. <laughs>